deadly toy shop that unleashes a terrible plague. A notorious Whitechapel murderer time travels to World War II. The strange disappearances that give birth to the Bermuda Triangle. And the macabre mummies of Skeleton Lake. A new kind of war, conflict on a scale never seen before or since. This is war at its weirdest. Incredible experiments. This has got to be one of the most bizarre weapons in the history of warfare. What is even crazier is it seems to work. Mysterious events. It does sound crazy, but we have eyewitnesses that claim that's what happened. Unexplained phenomena. They've never seen anything like this before. When a world goes to war with itself, things get really weird. Britain is tooling up against the Nazis. Britain needed to arm herself by any means necessary, and weapons manufacturers were forced to improvise. It's the most secretive and strange arms race in history. These are some of the most bizarre weapons. But when anything is possible, it's all too easy to go too far. There is a very fine line between ingenious and insane. From canned food to duct tape, some of the world's most creative inventions are developed in times of war. And many come about by accident. One such accident happened to Stuart McRae, editor of Armchair Science magazine. McRae is this typical kind of science geek. He's rather unassuming, and he's also the editor of this monthly magazine, which is full of weird and wonderful inventions and scientific gadgets. The story goes that McRae is visiting a friend, and while he's there, this child knocks over an entire jar of aniseed balls. McRae helps him to pick them up, and he pops one of these aniseed balls in his mouth, and he's sucking on it, and he's realising that it's dissolving at a very steady rate. And he has this eureka moment. This could be a bomb timer. The timing couldn't have been better because McRae has just been approached by a boffin from military development called Millis Jeffries, who is working on a really ingenious mine. The idea is very simple. It's a mine that will hold itself to its target with magnets. It's called the limpet mine after a sea snail that attaches itself to rocks. Jeffries just needs one more thing to make the limpet mine work. The mine explodes when a cock spring hits the detonator. But to prevent that happening, you put an aniseed ball between the two. When the aniseed ball dissolves, it makes a contact and sets off the detonation. This gives enough time for the saboteur to make his escape. It's brilliant. This sweet little idea goes on to be used to great effect. One of the most dramatic examples of their use was during Operation Jaywick on Japanese ships in Singapore Harbour. The commandos paddled their way into the harbour and placed limpet mines all over the Japanese ships. Now, the effect of this was devastating. They sunk or damaged seven Japanese warships. That's a good night's work. It's amazing to think that a crucial part of this bomb is a popular child sweetie. The success of the limpet mine catches the eye of Winston Churchill himself. Realising the potential of such left-field thinking, he gives the brilliant boffins a whole new sandbox to play in. Jeffries and McRae, the latter now drafted into the army, are given their own department with which to come up with more extraordinary inventions. This is known as Churchill's toy shop and is said to inspire the idea of Q in James Bond. And Churchill does this for good reason. Britain needs to arm itself against the Nazis, 
But with limited resources, the arms manufacturers are forced to improvise. This highly clandestine research establishment is there to develop these very innovative and clever new weapons to give British troops the edge they so desperately need on the battlefield. Churchill's toy shop is one of several units set up to create ingenious devices that will help win the war. Devices like the Piat anti-tank device, forerunner of the bazooka, inflatable tanks designed to fool German reconnaissance, squawker boy decoys that could scramble homing torpedoes, or lollipop-shaped sticky bombs that could be stuck on German tanks. On one level, it all seems like a bit of innocent DIY in a shed in someone's garden, wacky Heath Robinson-style inventions. But actually, these are very serious inventions. They cause real damage. Not always to the right people. The sticky bomb was notorious for sticking more easily to the uniforms of British soldiers than to the tracks of German tanks. And things are about to get much more serious. Allied intelligence receives reports about caches of horrifying new weapons being stockpiled in German arsenals. These weapons deploy deadly toxins such as mustard gas and sarin. The British are shocked at what they find and they're terrified by the lethal potential of these weapons. Now based at Porton Down, the toy shop's brainiacs decide to fight back with similar weapons of their own. The inventors at Porton Down come up with a bomb that releases hundreds of tiny needle-tipped darts that are designed to rain down on the enemy below. Inside each dart's hollow needle lies a pellet of deadly poison. And the inventors decide to unleash their latest creation on sheep. Sheep and goats are dispersed onto a mock battlefield, and each animal is swathed in a piece of uniform fabric. The researchers really want to know whether all these poison needles can actually penetrate the fabric and allow the poison to reach the skin beneath. The bombs hit their targets. The poor animals are left twitching and convulsing. The test is deemed a complete success. However, the needle bombs have one minor disadvantage. The scientists are so focused on developing this weapon that they overlook one really basic flaw. The darts can't penetrate armor, they can't penetrate buildings, they can't even penetrate vegetation such as trees. And so while a sheep or a goat will just stand in the middle of a field, a human being will just run for cover. Despite the failure of the poison dart bombs, Research into chemical and biological weapons continues. And soon, a new, more far-reaching chemical weapon is ready to be tested. It's called Operation Vegetarian, and it's developed in 1942 by the British military and the scientists at Porton Down. Despite its innocuous name, Operation Vegetarian marks an ominous change in Allied strategy. It involves innocent-looking linseed cakes. The plan is to infect the cakes with deadly anthrax spores, then drop the cakes over Germany, the cattle will eat the cakes and then die. Secondly, when the infected cattle are eaten as beef, the anthrax spores can actually pass through to humans. Now this could kill millions. Prototypes of the anthrax-infected linseed cakes are tested on the remote Grunard Island off the coast of Scotland. 80 sheep were taken to the island and bombs filled with anthrax were exploded very close to them. The result was that the sheep soon became infected and they began to die within days of their exposure. Churchill orders five million linseed cakes ready for a retaliatory strike against any German bioweapons attack. Luckily, they never need to be used. If these weapons had actually been used in Europe, then whole cities would have been rendered uninhabitable for the rest of the century. These are sinister inventions. They cause real damage to real people. The anthrax bombs may not have been used in the Second World War, but what they certainly represent is the start of biological warfare. 
The five million deadly cakes are incinerated after the war. But the ones used on Gruenard Island leave it contaminated with anthrax for another half century. A massive decontamination process started in 1986, in which 280 tons of formaldehyde, diluted with water, was sprayed over the entire island. What began as wacky inventions designed to give the plucky Brits an edge, transformed into a sinister arms race for the nastiest weapons on the planet. We're entering here really ethically disturbing territory. These new weapons are designed to kill and maim human beings in horrible new ways. Who could imagine where sucking on an aniseed ball could possibly lead you? Coming up, a brutal killer stalks the blacked-out streets of London. Nobody knows when this person is going to strike next. His methods remind people of another notorious murderer. Everybody has heard of Jack the Ripper. Who is the Blackout Ripper? And when does he come from? September 1888. A sadistic killer stalks his next victim. He's killed four women, brutally mutilating each one. His name will become a calling card for depravity. Everybody has heard of Jack the Ripper, the most notorious of the British serial killers. His reign of terror lasts for three short months. <coughs> then, after his fifth victim, he disappears. Nobody knows who he is or why he is committing these barbaric acts. Almost 50 years later, another killer stalks the streets of London. And as with Jack the Ripper, the women have been strangled and mutilated. Could this be the work of the same sadistic maniac 50 years later? Has Jack come back? Nineteen forty two. London endures a campaign of terror as the Luftwaffe bombards the city, destroying over one million buildings. Hitler is making good on his promises. German bombers are striking targets. 40,000 are dead. 100,000 are wounded. To limit the already catastrophic damage, the British government imposes a blackout on the city. Every evening, even before any air raid sirens sound to warn of impending raids, Londoners are ordered to turn off all their external lights. Street lights are switched off. Car headlamps are covered, windows are boarded up. London is plunged into complete darkness. The idea of the blackout is to ensure that enemy bombers can't use lights from the ground to be able to navigate and drop bombs on targets. Although the accuracy of the Luftwaffe bombers is reduced, the blackout has unintended consequences. We've all heard stories about camaraderie during the Blitz, but what we don't think of quite so much is that it was an amazing opportunity for crime to flourish. There's an underworld that has come to life. It's opportunistically taking advantage of the wartime circumstances to carry out whatever other criminal enterprise they might conceive of. Crime levels went up significantly at this period, and that is because there was much more opportunity to commit crime. When homes were bombed out, there were all these goods around that people could start looting. There were all sorts of new avenues for crime. To make matters worse, London's police force is severely depleted. Many policemen are now soldiers fighting the Nazis. Prisons are no longer able to deal with a large number of criminals, and many of them are released. And the result of that is that there's a 57% increase in crime. Thieves are not the only evildoers stalking the blacked-out streets. Something far more deadly is lurking in the shadows. <coughs> February the 9th, 1942. Police are called to an air raid shelter between Baker Street and Edgware Road. 
There they discover a body of a woman. She's been gagged and strangled with her own scarf. Money is taken from the victim's handbag, and police assume this is a robbery that's gone wrong. But before the investigation can get underway, the police get word of another body, this time at a flat in Wardour Street. When detectives arrive at the scene, they are greeted with a sight of unspeakable horror. They find a second victim, Evelyn Oatley. She has been brutally murdered, stabbed, strangled. They find that she's been sexually mutilated with a can opener. The scene was completely gruesome. There's blood, entrails everywhere. The lead detective, Frederick Cheryl, said to the victim that she had endured the most sadistic attack of the most horrible and revolting nature. But despite all this graphic carnage, this killer has left absolutely no trace, no clues of who he might be. The next day, Cheryl receives another phone call. The killer has struck again. The third victim is Margaret Lowe, and her body has been mutilated in a way that's even more disturbing than the previous victim. As the killer's confidence grows, so does his sadism. A silk stocking is tied around the woman's neck, her abdomen torn apart in a startling act of barbarity. His grisly tools of choice include a razor blade, knife, and candlestick. As Cheryl examines the mutilated corpse, a shocking realization dawns on him. Seeing these crime scenes and seeing the, the depths of depravity that this sociopath has sunk to, he cannot help but be reminded of what London was like when Jack the Ripper was on the loose. Details between the brutal crimes of Jack the Ripper and the current murders are eerily similar. All of the victims in these crimes are sex workers. They're prostitutes. They're all mutilated as a part of the murder. It has all of the signs of another Jack the Ripper. Knowing that serial killers like to have one last fix, is it possible that this is the work of the same sadistic maniac 50 years later? When the press get wind of the killings, they also make the comparison, christening the murderer the Blackout Ripper. Now Londoners have got something else to worry about. They're not just being hit by Nazi bombs, but they've also got this depraved maniac on the loose. The hunt for the Blackout Ripper continues. The police are desperate to catch him red-handed. It's obvious the Blackout Ripper is targeting sex workers, and so they think if they use female officers as bait, then they'll be able to lure him out and catch him. But for the Blackout Ripper, Real prostitutes are in plentiful supply. With husbands away at war and poverty widespread and a rationing of food, many women do turn to sex work as a way of increasing their income. Because of the pure number of sex workers in the streets of London, it's very unlikely that the killer will pick a female police officer as his next victim. Despite their efforts, police are powerless to stop him striking again. His next victim is prostitute Doris J. In typical Ripper fashion, she has been strangled and savagely mutilated. By now, there have been four killings, four brutal murders, and the authorities don't know who this person is. They have no leads, and nobody knows when this person is going to strike next. A breakthrough in the case finally comes when another woman is attacked. But this time, the victim is still alive. A woman called Greta Hayward is attacked in a doorway near Piccadilly Circus, but she manages to escape and she raises the alarm. When police scour the scene for clues, they discover an RAF issue gas mask lying on the ground. Whoever left this gas mask at the scene provided a very important clue. There was a number on the gas mask, and that number accorded to one individual in the Royal Air Force. The police trace this particular mask to 28-year-old RAF cadet Gordon Cummins. Cummins doesn't fit the profile of a serial killer at all. He's a married man, upper class, absolutely no history of violence whatsoever, and there's no explanation for why he has suddenly committed these crimes. 
when Cummins' fingerprints are cross-referenced with ones found at the scene of other victims, they are a match. Greta Haywood also identifies Cummins as her attacker in a lineup. Cummins is convicted and sentenced to be hanged. So Jack himself may not have returned, but his spirit clearly lived on. Cummins is too young to have been Jack the Ripper, but he does seem to have been inspired by him. In total, Cummins murders six women. This makes him more prolific than Jack the Ripper himself. But there's one difference. Cummins is caught. And unlike Jack, Cummins has slipped into obscurity, despite his despicable crimes. Everybody has heard of Jack the Ripper, but almost nobody nowadays has heard of the Blackout Ripper. I think it's because of the time he was living in. Death was something that people were living with on a daily basis. So here were just a few more unnecessary deaths. They didn't stand out. At dawn on June the 25th, 1942, the Blackout Ripper is executed without ever explaining the reason for his depraved rampage. He didn't even seem to be too upset about being caught. He, he was laughing during his trial, and when he was executed, it was in the middle of an air raid, which seems very fitting. He hunted women during the night, during the blackout, and he actually met his own doom at night. Coming up, five planes disappear off the Florida Keys in unusual circumstances. Radio issues, an experienced pilot losing his head, and unexpected weather changes. This is not normal. They spawn a modern myth. The investigation soon gives rise to one of the most enduring mysteries of recent history, the Bermuda Triangle. A routine training flight vanishes into thin air. The bombers disappear off the radar and they're never heard from again. A rescue plane disappears shortly after. Something weird is going on. Both of these air missions go missing. This gives birth to one of the most enduring legends of modern times. Within that area, Mysterious things happen. Flights of aircraft disappear. Ships on the high seas disappear without explanation. Fifth of December, 1945, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Five Avenger torpedo bombers are being prepped for a routine navigation flight. They are commanded by Lieutenant Charles Taylor. He's already completed one combat tour against the Japanese, clocked up two and a half thousand hours of flying, and that's largely in the Avenger aircraft, the one that he'll be taking out today. He's a safe pair of hands on an entirely routine mission. This is not a recipe for a catastrophe. But something isn't quite right. Taylor is not on time for the briefing, and he's reluctant to take on the mission. Taylor has a bad feeling. He reportedly pleads, I just don't want to take this one out. It's as though he's got some kind of premonition. He doesn't want to fly the mission, but he has a job to do, and he flies it anyway. 2 p.m., Lieutenant Taylor leads five Avengers carrying a total of 14 airmen. They set off on an exercise known as navigation problem number one. Navigation problem number one is designed to teach dead reckoning principles. This enables you to try and calculate the position of your aircraft from its last known position. The first part of the mission is going according to plan. Each plane practices its bomb run and then turns north, heading for Grand Bahama. But the lesson is about to go spectacularly wrong. The men begin to observe unusual compass readings where aircraft within the flight, and their compasses don't agree with one another. Leading another training mission in the skies at the same time is Lieutenant Cox, who picks up an unidentified transmission. 
It's one of the students of Flight 19 being asked for their compass reading. And the voice crackles over the radio. I don't know where we are. We must have got lost after that last turn. Cox immediately radios back and asks the plane to identify itself, but he gets no reply. Eventually, after repeated requests, Lieutenant Taylor finally comes on the radio. Both my compasses are out. I'm over land. I think I'm over Florida Keys. I don't even know how to get to Fort Lauderdale. These aircraft are flying blind. Compasses aren't working. They don't have a navigational fix on where they are. For the men on board the aircraft, it must have been a terrifying feeling. The weather takes a terrible turn. Winds and rain pelt the aircraft, making navigation even more difficult. The radio signals grow weaker, and the transmissions from the pilots more desperate. Cox advises Taylor that if he really is over the Florida Keys, then he should put the sun on his port wing and head north. But the clouds are closing in, and Taylor is not where he thinks he is. He also seems to be ignoring all the standard procedures for disorientated pilots. Taylor has a device on board called identification friend or foe. This would enable ground control to be able to identify him. But for some reason, Taylor has not turned it on, despite Cox asking him to. Cox begins to have his own troubles. A relay on his radio burns out, and he can no longer get hold of Taylor. Landing back in Fort Lauderdale, Cox quickly runs to the duty officer and says, I need a plane to go and locate Flight 19. But he's denied permission. Radio chatter between the planes is still being monitored, but Taylor is not responding to any helpful suggestions. One of Taylor's pilots is clearly aware of his commander's mistake. If only we could head west, we could get home. Damn it, head west. But Taylor keeps taking the flight east, out into open water, and the Avengers are running out of fuel. They only have enough fuel for five hours of flying, but they've already been in the air for four hours. So if the base wants to mount a rescue mission, they'd better do it right now. Fort Lauderdale has no choice. They launch a rescue mission. Two seaplanes depart. But after 23 minutes, one of them drops off the radar, and its crew of 13 men are never seen again. The search party mounted the day after the disappearances is one of the largest in history. The Navy is in a desperate situation to figure out what happened to this flight of aircraft. And so the Navy launches a search operation that would ultimately cover 200,000 square miles with 248 aircraft looking for the men of Flight 19. They find nothing but empty ocean, not a life preserver, no floating debris of any kind. Flight 19 has disappeared. The disappearances are bizarre. All involved are struggling to make sense of the loss. Two missions and 27 airmen all lost in a single day. Could this really be a coincidence? For lack of any obvious explanation, all sorts of theories are put forward to explain the mysterious disappearance. When the flight took off, the weather was clear. But it's believed that they flew into an area where they could potentially have dealt with something that aviators call spatial disorientation. You lose the horizon, and you have to fly on instruments, and your mind and your body tell you something that disagrees with what's in front of you. When you add the fact that compasses are not cooperating, that could be what brought down Flight 19. And many believe that the region itself was the cause of this spatial disorientation. The investigation into Flight 19 soon gives rise to one of the most enduring mysteries of recent history, the Bermuda Triangle. A disproportionate number of ships and planes disappear in this area on a regular basis. I mean, this has been known as far back as 1492 when Columbus was making his famous voyage and he noticed these strange magnetic anomalies in that area. These vanishings have repeated over the years. Radio issues, navigation equipment problems, an experienced pilot losing his head, and unexpected weather changes. This is not normal. It has led to speculations that there's something mystical, magic, 
and threatening going on in this triangle that runs from Florida to Bermuda down to the Bahamas. This routine flight of Avenger torpedo bombers flies out over the Bahamas toward what we now know as the Bermuda Triangle and then disappear. Many simply cannot believe that a pilot of Charles Taylor's caliber could have made such a rookie navigation error. How could somebody with so much experience just fly off the map like that? Some of the theories are simply out of this world. Very early on, there's some speculation that maybe these planes and their crew have been abducted. Without any other possible explanation out there, there are those that believe that they were simply abducted by UFOs. Over the following decades, the idea is fueled by the media. There was a lot written by popular writers and in fiction on television programs about these kind of abductions, and these speculations are very much informed by films like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. As a child, I was riveted by the opening scene where Spielberg chose to start with the sudden surprise reappearance of Flight 19 in the desert. But there is more to the Bermuda Triangle than simply aliens. Until today, many people believe that weird paranormal forces operate in the area. Only recently, there have been a couple of unexplained incidents. In 2017, a private plane was at 24,000 feet when it lost contact with air traffic control in Miami. A mix of extreme weather conditions and strange, unexplained interferences seems to have been to blame. In the same year, a Turkish Airlines plane traveling from Havana to Washington was forced to change direction when it encountered weird mechanical and electrical problems en route. The area is also notorious for its violently freakish weather events. Could the five Avengers have fallen prey to one of these? The area east of Florida is well known for its very dramatic weather patterns. After all, this is a place where you get huge thunderstorms and very changeable weather conditions. We often hear about hurricanes and tornadoes in this region, and of course, they have a devastating effect. Then there's the seaplane that was sent out to help Flight 19, which also mysteriously disappeared. Or perhaps not so mysteriously after all. The PBM Mariner aircraft was known as the flying gas tank because it had these huge tanks that gave it enormous range. Witnesses on a nearby oil tanker saw a huge explosion up in the sky at around the same time as the aircraft disappeared. And a little later, there was a big oil slick in the ocean. It looks very likely that mariner simply exploded. Yet such a simplistic explanation cannot account for the disappearance of the five Avengers of Flight 19. Was it alien abduction? Was it human error? Was it pilot error? Was it spatial disorientation? Was it a magnetic anomaly that caused instrument failure? We still don't know. In spite of renewed searches with the very most modern technology, I don't think there's any chance this mystery is going to be solved in the near future. Coming up, a macabre discovery in a frozen lake. The lake bed is full of skeletons, human skeletons. Has investigators fearing the worst? Rootkund Lake might be the site of a dreadful massacre. A scenic lake holds a deadly secret. The lake is completely covered in bones and skulls. It's like something out of a horror movie. Is this the scene of some gruesome death ritual? These people might be the victims of some sort of terrible massacre. The locals believe it's the wrath of the gods. And amazingly, they might be right. Nineteen forty two, British India. Foot soldier HK Madwal is on patrol at the base of the Himalayas, sixteen thousand feet above sea level. He comes to this small glacier lake high up in the mountains. Normally, Rupkun Lake is frozen, but it's actually partially thawed. What he sees 
shocks him to the core. When he peers into the depths of the lake, he sees that it is full of bones and that there are skulls piled up at the banks. He sees that the lake bed is full of skeletons. Human skeletons. He counts over 300 bodies in total and rushes off to tell his superiors of his discovery. A British Army team is sent out to investigate the macabre mortuary. Some corpses still have flesh and even hair on them, which makes the investigators think that they are reasonably fresh. It may well be the bodies of Japanese soldiers. The presence of Japanese troops so high in the Himalayas sets alarm bells ringing. The Japanese are sweeping across Asia. British-held India is their next target. Their invasion plan is called Operation Yugo. Operation Yugo is the code name given to the attempted invasion of British-held Northeast India. It's a really mighty assault involving some five divisions and nearly 100,000 men. Perhaps these mysterious mummies were part of an earlier attempt to bypass British defences by hiking through the Himalayas. This could well be evidence of some kind of surprise attack on India. It's a very unlikely spot to attack from, so it could be kind of a blitzkrieg move that would take the British by surprise. Now, it's quite likely that this group of Japanese soldiers had got lost in this very inaccessible part of the Himalayas and then simply starved and then froze to death. The area in which they found is at 16,000 feet. It's permanently covered in ice and snow, and at night the temperatures can drop as low as minus 20. The locals have a very different theory. They think the troops were killed by magic. The locals are very strongly religious, so they believe that this is a sign from the gods that they're on the side of the Allies, that they are protecting India. There are also rumours of a Himalayan goddess who protects the mountains against trespassers. Perhaps she's responsible? According to local folklore, this mysterious goddess rains death upon those who displease her. But the British investigators don't believe in vengeful spirits. They quickly dismiss the story and explore more likely options. There may have been a landslide, which is not uncommon in that area, and they happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. There are some other theories as well as to what could have happened. They include things like a rapid epidemic that struck them all down, but there is no evidence to support either of these theories. The case becomes even more baffling when the investigators notice a startling detail about these frozen corpses. Every one of the 300 corpses has a gaping hole in the top of their head. It seems that Rupkund Lake might be the site of a dreadful massacre. The prime suspects are, of course, the Japanese army. The Imperial Japanese Army is brutal. A good example is the Nanking Massacre of 1937, where almost 100,000 Chinese troops were slaughtered. But further discoveries from the site blow all previous theories out of the water. When they begin looking further into the lake, they find they're looking at things like spearheads and jewellery, and all of it indicates something far older than modern Japanese items. These artefacts place the investigation in a completely different category. Confident they're not dealing with the corpses from some Japanese invasion, the British stand down the investigation and they think, this is a job for archaeologists and we're not going to do that during the war. The frozen mummies of Skeleton Lake are put on ice. Until 2004, when an expedition to the site reopens the case. Oxford University scientists examine the skeletons and they carry out carbon dating. And what they discover is that these bodies come from about 850 AD. The freezing conditions have prevented the bodies from decaying which explains why the frozen mummies still have flesh and hair. The cold and very dry climate of the highest mountain range on Earth makes the ideal conditions for cryopreserving a body. A good example of this is the 5,000-year-old mummified body of a murder victim found in the Italian Alps. 
Nicknamed Ötzi, he was a 45-year-old man. He was in incredibly good condition. His, his skin was preserved, his hair, contents of his stomach, and it gives extraordinary insight into life in prehistoric Europe. Similarly, at Rubkundleg, the bodies have been extremely well preserved. When they analyze their DNA, experts discover that these bodies come from two ethnically distinct groups. Could this mean that Rupkund Lake was the site of an ancient battle? If it were a battlefield, you'd expect the normal battle wounds. Scattered limbs, broken bones. But these skeletons are perfectly preserved and perfectly intact. The frozen mummies may not have battle wounds, but each still has a blow to the head. The interesting thing about the injuries that have been sustained by these people is that there's nothing in the lower extremities. Everything is on the head and shoulders, which indicates to scientists that whatever has killed them has come from above. Maybe it was some kind of ritual sacrifice. It's almost as if these people were killed while they were kneeling down. But if these were sacrificial victims, you'd expect the blows to be more targeted than they are. These skeletons have been pummeled on the head and shoulders. They haven't been taken out cleanly with a single aimed blow. The random nature of these injuries reminds the scientists of a story they heard once before. A local legend they had long dismissed as nonsense. There is a folk song about a goddess who is so incensed by people defiling her mountain sanctuary that she rains death down upon them in the form of giant hailstones. Suddenly, the genetic mix of the mummies starts to make a different kind of sense. It suggests that one of the groups was very closely related and the other may have been local porters or guides, not unlike the Sherpas in the Himalayas today. This area around the Himalayas is home to some of the most sacred sites for Hindus and Buddhists. So it's possible that they were en route to one of these sacred places. Add gigantic hailstones into the mix, and a bizarre but plausible possibility starts to emerge. It seems likely that all these corpses were those caught in a massive storm of giant hailstones. They're talking like the size of cricket balls, like rock hard. You've got to imagine all these people are trapped in a valley with nowhere to shelter. They are just left at the mercy of these giant hailstones. After they're killed, the bodies are covered with water, and that water then freezes. The bodies lay in Skeleton Lake for 1,200 years, until 1942. And it's the icy and dry conditions in the Himalayas that preserve these bodies so well. Whatever transgression these pilgrims may have made, the locals were right. The goddess did exact her revenge upon them. This shows you again that the truth can be far stranger than any of the theories that preceded it.